when you live in the light of the cross, people will misunderstand you. Living the surrendered life. You know, um, following Jesus, following Jesus, if we're going to be successful in following Jesus, we must be completely surrendered to him. We have to give him our all. The Bible tells us in the book of St. Matthew chapter 16, until we are go about a conversation that Jesus had with the disciples. But just before I share that, I must give you a little context. You know, um, Jesus came into this world as the Messiah, the Son of God, to save us from sin. And when he came, he didn't come as a prince or as a king upon a throne. He came in a manger. And as he accepted baptism from John the Baptist and entered upon his ministry, there are some disciples, Peter and his brother Andrew, who recognize him, Nathaniel, as the son of God. And he called them, he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. But the disciples, as they followed the Lord, didn't understand his mission fully. They didn't know the complete picture and Jesus did not reveal it to them. He simply said, follow me. And by the time came close to the end of his ministry, when he needed to reveal to them exactly what his mission was. But Jesus understanding the, the misunderstood nature of his mission, he made sure to have this important personal conversation with them first. The Bible said in Matthew 16, verse 13, it says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And you know the story? The Bible said, tells us that the disciples confessed that the Jews did not accept him to be the son of God. They did not recognize him to be the son of God. Some say you are John the Baptist. Some say Jeremiah, a good man. But that was not enough. And then Jesus asked the disciples the question, but whom do you say that's, that I, the son of man, am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. As I studied this, this passage, it came unto me what Jesus wanted to accomplish. Jesus knew <laughs> the rest of the journey was going to be turbulent. Jesus knew that the rest of the journey was going to take great faith and courage. Jesus knew that when he revealed his true mission, and by the way, LNG White tells us that before this, Jesus had not revealed his true mission to the disciples except for Nicodemus. Nicodemus was the only one he told that as the son of man, as, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up. And Jesus told Nicodemus that, but he never told the disciples. But as soon as the disciples confessed him, the Bible tells us, as he commended Peter, says, Fresh and blood have not revealed this unto you. Verse 21 says that from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. But before Jesus revealed that to the disciples, he asked them the question, whom do you say that I am? And when Peter said, thou art the Christ, Jesus was basically saying, do you know me to be the Christ? Do you trust me? Do you believe that I am the one who called this world into existence? I am the one who spake and it was done, who commanded and it stood fast. 
Do you believe that I am the one who sustains you? I am the one to whom you must look for life and sustenance. Then if you believe that I am the Christ, then trust me. What Jesus is saying is, trust me that where I lead now, you are going to follow. <laughs> you see, the disciples had faithfully followed Jesus up until this point. But Jesus knew that this experience would test their faith. And he wanted to assure them, not only with this conversation, but in the next chapter, he was revealed in glory to the disciples, the three disciples upon the Mount of Transfiguration. He was basically saying to them, if you trust me that I am God, if you trust me that I am not only a prophet, then you must be willing to follow me where I'm going now. But Peter never liked that. Peter said, Lord, this will never happen to you. And Jesus said to him, get me behind me, Satan. For thou art an offense unto me. For thou savest not the thing that be of God, but do that be of men. And then Jesus said to them, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In other words, if you're going to follow me all the way, you must be surrendered. If you're going to go with me all the way that I am going, self must be abandoned. And Jesus said three things that we need to do in order to successfully follow him, even to the cross. Number one, he says, deny, if any man will come after me, he must do three things. One, he must deny himself. In other words, he must give up his own personal agenda. He must give up his own self sense of self-importance. He must be willing to abandon control and give the Holy Spirit control. He must be willing to surrender all. But you see, the thing is that the disciples, what the disciples had in mind was that by, by their connection with Jesus, they felt that by their connection with the Messiah, they were going to be highly esteemed and they were going to be considered great. And they cherish these ambitions. And what Jesus said to them is that you are minding earthly things. You are not thinking about the things of God. You are thinking about the things of man. This was a challenge that the rich young ruler faced when he came to Jesus and says, what must I do to have eternal life? He wanted to follow Jesus. But he was unwilling to surrender. And the message this morning is that we cannot truly follow Jesus unless we are fully surrendered to him. The Apostle Peter, by the experience of the cross, when he denied Jesus, Peter's denial of Jesus was evidence that he was not fully surrendered. Peter's denial of Christ was evidence that there were some areas of his life that he was still holding control. He was still taking control of those aspects of his life. But Jesus wanted full control. And then G.Y. tells us in the book Testimonies, I think volume one, God leads his people on step by step at different points calculated to see what is in their hearts. And every time God leads us to examine ourselves to see what is it that is keeping him from having full control, the Lord is saying that we must surrender and give him our all. Why do we need to surrender? Because self is corrupt. Self is irreparable. Self is what clings to the world. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8 and verse 5 that if 
those who are carnally minded to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because a carnal mind is at enmity with God. Not only that, it is not subject to the law of God, and neither indeed can be. So there is no opportunity for repair. And that's why God wants us to abandon that old life and surrender so that he can take full control of our lives. So we must first deny self. The word deny means to, to deny any knowledge or relationship to. <laughs> you don't know this man. That's how you deny self. The second thing that Jesus says we must do to follow him successfully is that we must take up our cross. The cross is a symbol of death. We know the story that the cross symbolized Roman, Roman capital punishment. It was so cruel that no Roman citizen was crucified. And what the Jesus, the reason Jesus called upon this method is not just because he himself would surrender at the cross, but the cross symbolized the worst type of death you can think about. And when people were being crucified in those days, some of them would resist and, 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 and fight to the very end. Jesus is saying, don't fight, but surrender. <laughs> don't fight, but surrender. The other thing that the cross teaches us, the surrender of the cross, is that to, to surrender to Christ is not a one-time experience. When we surrender to Christ, we are, now going to, we are now going to live a surrendered life. Because Jesus said, you must take up your cross daily and follow me. It's not just about surrendering yesterday and at the start of my journey and that's it. No, the life that you're going to live is a surrendered life. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, <laughs> yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I no longer live <laughs> my own life. Christ lives in me. That's what it means to die daily. But the Apostle Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus is our example of what it means to live a surrendered life. Because the Bible tells us that he who thought it not robbery to be equal with God made himself of no reputation. The thing that you need to understand about a surrendered life, my brothers and sisters, is that when you live in the light of the cross, People will misunderstand you. People will not understand why you're doing the thing that you did. People will not understand why you're operating that way. And the same thing with Jesus. People misunderstood him. People were wondering, if you are the son of God and have so much power, why do you subject yourself to such treatment? And that's why Peter was saying to him, Lord, you are the son of God. People will not treat you that way. Because Peter never understood that the way of the cross is ridiculed. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2 that God used the foolishness of the cross to confound the world. When you decide to surrender yourself to Christ and follow him, I don't have time to go into it. But people will not understand the way that you're operating. The third thing that Jesus said that must do is that number one, they should deny themselves, take up their cross, and then follow me. The third thing, my brother and sister, it has two implications. Number one is that we cannot faithfully follow Jesus unless we are fully surrendered. James tells us that one of the reasons we have so much problem and quarrel in the church it is because we have people in the church, listen to me carefully now, 
We have people in the church who claim to be following Jesus, but they are not surrendered. And so self is there actively involved, <laughs> trying to protect and preserve self. And that's why you always have conflict and, and fight. But the Apostle Paul says, brethren, if you're going to have unity, the mind of Christ must be in you. He says, listen, if you're going to faithfully follow me, you must be surrendered. And that's, that's the point that Abraham got. Abraham got the point when, G, when God called Abraham, Abraham followed. But there were times when along the journey, in order to protect himself, Abraham chose to take control. And twice he told lies to kings, to heathen kings about his wife in order to protect and to preserve his own life. It wasn't until the cross, until the experience with Isaac, when God told him to sacrifice Isaac and Abraham exercised that faith to believe that he doesn't need to protect himself. He doesn't need to surrender. And he's and exercising faith in the resurrection Abraham surrendered to God and God said to him, Abraham, don't touch that boy because now I know that you fear me. Now I know that you're fully surrendered. The same thing with Moses and all the other um, great of the Bible. Moses was there as, 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 as next to the Pharaoh, but God could not use him because Moses was not surrendered. And after 40 years, God found him in the wilderness and said, yes, no, Moses, you are ready <laughs> because you are fully surrendered. Quickly, now as I wrap this up, the story is told about a group of ministers, a committee of ministers who were discussing about a preacher for an evangelistic campaign. Dwight L. Moody was, was name was being considered. And one gentleman got up and said, why Moody? Does he have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? And the place was quiet for a time. And a, and a, and a senior gentleman got up and said, listen, Dwight Moody does not have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit have a monopoly on him. We cannot, the Holy Spirit cannot have monopoly on us until we are fully surrendered. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer who says, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. <laughs> and Christ cannot use us until we are dead, until we are crucified. And then we can truly obey the command, follow me. And finally, before I close, the next thing that Jesus said to them, he gave them the reward of those who follow him. He said, listen, the opposite of surrender is trying to preserve your life and that's why he says for whosoever will save his life will lose it jesus knows that in order to surrender we're going to lose something and, and the temptation to wonder if we're going to lose everything is there so jesus assures us that listen whosoever loses life for my sake he will find it for what will it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? In other words, what is there in the world that can be so precious that you're afraid to lose it for my sake? Even if you put all the things together in the world and calculate them, none of them is of, so, of value outside of what I'm going to give to you. So, Losing your life from, for Christ's sake is the key to victory. And I want to close with these two passages of scripture that assures us of the victory that we have. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 17 to 18, he says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, Work it for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 
because some of us choose not to surrender because we are worried about how people are going to treat us. We are worried about how the world is going to view us. But Paul is saying that the ridicule and the, and the bad treatment that we face in this life for Christ's sake, he says, it is light and it is momentary. It is only for a season. But he says, he says, it is far more, ex, um, working for us a far more exceeding weight and eternal glory. The reward that we get for following Jesus is eternal and it is exceeding. For we look not on the things which are seen, but on the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And finally, Jesus said in Matthew 19, 28 to 29, after the return ruler decided that he cannot surrender, the disciples said, wait. We admired that man so much. Then if he can't be saved, then how can we be saved? Jesus said, listen, verily I say unto you that he, you which have followed me, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you also shall sit and dwell with the tribe of Israel. And everyone, listen now, everyone that has forsaken houses, because you see, listen, Jesus knows what some of us have to surrender in order to follow him. And so he lists some of those things. And he said, listen, everyone who have forsaken houses, sometimes you have to leave that house because people fighting and over it too much. Our brethren, our sisters, our father, our mother, our wife, our children, our lands, our position in church, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, Plus eternal life. Can you put that on your calculator, Pastor Hussein? Put eternal life on your calculator and see how much it's worth. And see if it's worth forsaking all for. May God help us by the grace of God to live that surrendered life. And the way to live that surrendered life is to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. May God help us that we'll follow Jesus not part of the way, but let's follow Jesus all the way, even to the death of the cross. It was because Peter, after the cross, he got this point that when Jesus met him and said, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Simon was no more boastful. Simon was no more impetuous. Simon was more humble because he was fully, he understood. Simon realized that he cannot allow self to live any at all. He said, yes, Lord, you know, I love you. And that was when Jesus was ready to use Peter. He says, feed my sheep, feed my lamb, because you know, understand what it means to follow me. May God help us to, to follow Jesus as Peter did. God bless you.